When Linda asked me last year to come speak, uh, the first thing that came to my mind was that many of you may not be familiar with ROTC. And uh, after talking to many of you through the social hour, I'm actually kind of wrong. Uh, many of you have either been in ROTC yourself or at least familiar with it in some way, shape, or form. But uh, I still think it's important to kind of introduce those folks that might not be familiar with it, um, talk a little bit about its establishment, uh, and talk about how it's changed over time. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we go about training our current future leaders um, in today's uh, contemporary environment. So I thought I'd just start out with what ROTC is, right? And it simply, s simply it is just a program that trains and educates college students in order to become military officers. Okay, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force all run their own programs. Uh, but I'm going to primarily be speaking about the Army side today. I'll let the Navy and Air Force speak about their own programs. Uh, the Army has uh, ROTC programs at 275 institutions across the United States and trains students from about 1,500 different schools. So the host program that I run is out of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, and we train students that attend Harvard, Tufts, Wellesley, uh, and then as well as uh, Gordon College, Endicott College, and Salem State University about an hour north. Um, how many ROTC graduates or ROTC participants have there, do we have? Well, quite a few. Any from the programs that I just mentioned? I know I talked to a Norwich few. Norwich University. And Norwich University, good enough, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> good to see another uh, member from the WIC. Uh, so many of them can tell you, and it may have been different, just uh, I know you graduated only about two or three years before I did. Uh, that ROTC students on top of their undergraduate degree program also spend about 10 to 12 hours a week uh, through the ROTC curriculum, conducting physical training, going to leadership laboratories, uh, and attending weekend training events, uh, usually one entire weekend during each semester. Uh, on top of that, there's many non-mandatory voluntary training exercises that go on over the summer and during other weekends. And then there's a mandatory four-week training exercise that goes on between the junior and senior year. The, um, for context, the ROTC program, in the Army at least, commissions about 75% of the total Army officer population, with about 20% coming out of the Military Academy at West Point, and the remainder coming out of either the Officer Candidate School or direct commission for those uh, that are going to be a doctor or a lawyer. Um, and in 100 years since we've been in existence, at least in the Army side, we have had 600,000 uh, officers commissioned out of the program including former Secretary of State and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colin Powell, Tim a young man, uh, a sitting Supreme Court Justice in Sam Alito, legendary football coach Lou Holtz, the founder of Walmart, uh, and the current and many former Chief of Staff of the Army. Uh, but before I get into what we do for our future cadets uh, and our future leaders, what I wanted to go back is, uh, go back to how the, this whole ROTC, ROTC thing kind of started. Uh, and it starts with a former superintendent at West Point, who the Norwich University grads will know, uh, as a guy named Alden Partridge. Uh, so that good looking guy right there is uh, Captain Alden Partridge. He, um, he really had this kind of novel system of education where he combined civil and military studies um, in order to make enlightened and useful citizen soldiers. So like John Milton, Alden Partridge thought that the ideal education for future officers was, was a liberal one that prepared youth to discharge in the best possible manner the duties they owe to themselves, to their fellow men, and to their country. Uh, unfortunately, when he was at West Point as the superintendent, he was unable to introduce his ideas there. Primarily, he wanted to bring in some civilian students into the school and have them pave their own way and then have them join the reserve component. Um, so he was kicked out of that school uh, and instead opened up his own university, which was called the American Literary, Scientific, and Military Academy in Norwich, Vermont. Uh, and that top left picture there, I'm sorry from your perspective, the top right picture is the Old South Barracks, which uh, burned down in 1866. Uh, after that went away, he moved the campus up to Norwich, Vermont, uh, and re I'm sorry, Northfield, Vermont, and renamed it Norwich University, which is our alma mater. Uh, but the concept of military training at civilian universities across the United States didn't start until about 1862 with the Morrill Act, or also known as the Land Grant Act. 
And as part of this legislation, schools were developed through federally funded lands and federal funds. And in return, those schools needed to provide a curriculum that included instruction in military tactics. Okay, so because of this curriculum that was instituted at the schools, many of these schools developed a Corps of Cadets or Cadet Regiments and Cadet Battalions so they could train their cadets while they were attending school. So here, the picture here off to your left is the first uh, staff officers for the Cadet Battalion at MIT in 1869. Uh, to the far right is uh, the Cadet Battalion in 1875 for MIT. And in fact, I don't know if you can recognize those buildings if you're familiar with Boston. That's the corner of Berkeley and Newberry Street. The building in the far back is the Church of the Covenant. Um, and off to the far right was the Museum of Natural History uh, and is now a store for um, restoration hardware. So if you head down to, to Berkeley and Newberry, you'll be able to see that. Um, so these cadet battalions that they established really became a starting point for what would become the ROTC battalions later on. Uh, but in the years leading up to the First World War, there was uh, quite a, de a debate raging across the United States about um, uh, universal military training. Uh, and many folks, as you know, there's not a tradition of a large peacetime army within the United States, and certainly not a tradition of, uh, of conscription, unlike there was in Germany and France. Um, so hoping to reverse that trend, many civil and military advocates instead opted for this idea of preparedness as a way to get after national security. So after the Germans sank the Lusitania in May of 19... Um, 18, I'm sorry, 1915, the Americans started recognizing that there was a possibility that we we're going to have to enter into the Great War. So Major General Leonard Wood, who was the Chief of Staff of the Army and is pictured up there talking to former President Teddy Roosevelt, established some training camps. Uh, and the first one that he established was in August of 1915 at Plattsburgh, New York, with 1,200 enrollees with the purpose of training additional potential Army officers in the event that we entered the war. And by the, the end of 1917, more than 17,000 men had gone through these camps, mostly of them either college students or recent college graduates. So a direct result of this preparedness movement was the National Defense Act of 1916. And as part of this legislation, it established the Reserve Officer Training Corps units at uh, multiple civilian universities across the nation, mostly from those cadet regiments and cadet battalions from the land-grant colleges. So the training officially began in October of 1916. Um, and of course, world events outpaced America's ability to produce uh, a large number of officers through this ROTC program. And by the end of World War I, we had only produced 133 offices, officers. Um, but following World War I, there was a fresh influx of funds um, and RTC grew to include over 220 colleges and campuses just in the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s. And during these early years between World War I and World War II, the RTC units were branch specific. So at a place like Harvard, which is the Harvard Regiment is up there in the top picture, centered on uh, Widener Library and Harvard Yard, that's from uh, Memorial Day in 1917. The ROTC program at Harvard was very infantry specific. So anybody that attended Harvard and went through ROTC graduated as an infantry officer and all of their training that they received on campus was as an infantry officer. At MIT in the bottom right corner, that's from 1940, they had a coastal artillery unit, as Linda had mentioned earlier, and a uh, signal corps unit. So everybody that went through MIT and joined the Army ROTC program was trained to be either a coastal artillery or a, or a signal corps officer. So the training that they received was very specific and very vocational in nature, depending on the specialty that they were going to have in the military. So once the Army mobilized for World War II is when ROTC really got its first test. From August 1940 until December 1941, 80,000 organized reserve officers, most of them ROTC graduates, were finally called into service and fought very valiantly in World War II. Now, the years following World War II, with the buildup of the Cold War tensions, uh, Congress had passed what was known as the Selective Service Act. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with that. And part of that legislation encouraged tens of thousands of college students to enroll in ROTC in order to fulfill their military obligation through either service in Korea or Vietnam. And in 1964, the ROTC Revitalization Act was passed. And as part of that act, 
Congress authorized additional funds, which turned to scholarships, which incentivized, this, incentivized top tier students to join the ROTC programs, including a number of other efforts that occurred in the 1970s. Uh, one was an additional funding for the scholarships. Uh, they authorized new training programs during the summer, such as attendance in airborne and air assault school. Um, they included an early commissioning program as part of the milita military junior colleges. So you could go to a military junior college in only two years and commission. And they also instituted what was called the simultaneous membership program. So that soldiers that were already in the reserve or national guard could continue their higher education while serving and completing their undergraduate degree. Uh, and in 1973, the ROTC program was officially open to women for the first time, and within two years, uh, women accounted for over 29% of the ROTC program. From this point forward, the ROTC curriculum of training and education really had not changed since Vietnam up through when I was a kid in the 1990s, really up until just a few years ago. Uh, and really what we saw was that, uh, well, and the other thing that, that changed uh, in that time is the ROTC units were not branch specific. So rather than go to Harvard and become an infantry officer, cadets would join the program and they got to choose or select which specialty they went into. Uh, at least they chose what their priority was and then based on their performance with their academic GPA, their physical fitness, and how well they did at camp, they would be chosen as to what branch they would be selected into. Now that camp that they go to during their junior and senior year is primarily focused on small unit infantry tactics. Um, so what we ended up seeing as part of the ROTC training and education curriculum is that many of the programs were focused on not on preparing officers to be second lieutenants in the Army when they graduated, but it was focused on preparing juniors to go and do well at camp. In other words, teach them how to run a small 10-person squad through infantry tactics, even if that's not what they were going to do in the Army. So what's changed since then? Well, a couple of things have happened in the, in the years that has driven some changes. Number one is uh, the Army ha in, the, in the past has had a very viable threat that we had to focus on prior to the end of the Cold War. Uh, what focused the Army's training up until that time was a massive Soviet invasion into Eastern Europe through the Fulda Gap. And everything that the Army done, all of its doctrine, was all predicated on preparing for that type of invasion. The second thing that happened is we spent the last 15 years at war in a very different conflict than what we had been training for for the many decades prior to that. So Iraq and Afghanistan, we realized that we needed culturally astute leaders that were going to operate independently rather than as large formations trying to slow down the Soviet horde. We also realized, um, which I think it took us several decades to realize, is we're no longer training every single officer to be an infantry officer. Uh, and what we needed to do was prepare them to generally lead their organizations. Uh, and it's up to them, and once they get into the Army for their branch-specific organization, to teach them how to do their branch specialty. So how do you go about doing that? Um, you know, first of all, I don't, I don't want to downplay Army soldiering. It is still important to be able to shoot, move, and communicate, much like we have in those top three pictures there. Uh, but what we really need is for our soldiers and our future leaders to be able to, as, as Linda had mentioned, uh, develop leaders who can be agile and adaptive, who can think critically and creatively in order to deal with the complex and ambiguous problems that we've had to deal with now for the last 15 and longer years. So how do we kind of do that? The first thing we did is we moved away from small infantry unit tactics as the primary focus of our training. We still do it, but rather than using that as a end in itself, we use it as a means to get after leader development. Because we still think it's important to go out to the field, um, try and lead a small organization while you're kind of tired and wet and muddy. It does build character, and you can get after those types of things. Uh, but in the end, that's not what Cadet LaMarche is going to end up doing in the Army, and it's not what 95% of the officers that we commission in the Army is not going to go out and lead small infantry units. So we just need, that. We, we need to focus on more of the critical and creative thinking part. Uh, the second thing is we, we looked at how we go about educating our students. Um, and there was, there's always a big debate within the Army about how much training versus education you do. Uh, and, and what we say about training is that it helps develop or, or helps you deal with the known problems, uh, and education helps you deal with the unknown problems. Uh, and I think it was um, Rumsfeld a few years ago, had, or maybe it was Secretary Gates had mentioned a few years ago, um, that when it comes to preparing for the next uh, army and, and figuring out, or the next enemy and figuring out who it is, we're 100%. We always get it wrong. 
So we always know that we're never going to be able to 100% prepare for what is that next enemy or the next adversary we need to deal with. So we need people to be educated in order to think through the problems when they arise. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we use a, rather than iteration after iteration of small unit infantry tactics, uh, we use what I'll call a combination of history, theory, doctrine, and practical exercise. Um, what I think that does is help with the critical and creative thinking and dealing with those complex environments. Now, for the non-educators out there, um, there is a framework that you can use in order to look at educational goals. And one of those things is called Bloom's Taxonomy. And at the lower levels of those educational goals are things like knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis. And at the higher levels are things like synthesis and evaluation. And I use kind of my watch as, a, uh, as an analogy to figure out what the difference is. So if I took this watch apart and I labeled each of the components and I said, OK, this is a crown. These are the hands. This is the face. These are the bells and whistles that are inside. What I've done is I've just analyzed that. I've taken it apart. I've broken it into cons constituent parts. But I don't know anything about how this watch works. Right? So that's a lower level of learning. If I want to get to the higher level of learning, then I need to know that this crown right here has a little knob that goes inside, that turns the dials inside, that makes the, the hands move. And when I look at it from the top across that face, now I can tell the time. And what that is is synthesis. It's telling me how the parts work together in order to understand this system in place. And that's the higher level of learning that we want them to get to. How do the variables that operate within our environment work with each other rather than just follow a simple checklist of what individual battle drills do I need to, do I need to follow? So my experience uh, of what I went through as an RTC graduate and what I understand had gone on for many years prior to was there was a lot of analysis and application going on. Analysis in terms of here is your terrain and here is your mission and let's break it down into constituent parts. What are the avenues of approach? What are the cover and concealment that can be offered? Uh, what obstacles are in your way? And then application. Go do a uh, linear ambush and here's all the steps that you need to do and the cadet just takes it and goes and follows it. And I don't think that was getting what we wanted to really get after. So rather than just doing that, what we want our students to do now is be given a mission and be able to plan, prepare, execute, and continually assess rather than just follow a checklist of items. And I think this helps them so that not only are they looking through the entirety of the problem, but they're considering all the interdependent variables, they're considering second and third order effects to their decisions, and other unintended consequences. And what we realize that in order to do this, you cannot just give them a task any place, any time to go do it, you have to build an entire scenario around it. So within the Army, we use a common scenario uh, based on the Caspian Sea region, covers Azerbaijan, Armenia, Turkey, uh, that builds throughout their course year um, and provides them the depth uh, and the background within a scenario that they can utilize in order to solve more complex problems rather than a very shallow problem such as just go do this ambush at a certain place or time. Some of the ways that we do this, and I've shown some pictures on the bottom, uh, is they do a lot of group classwork, thinking about threats, opportunities, challenges that go along within whatever scenario we're giving them. We're able to use some of the technology that's afforded to us in this 21st century, such as map exercises, uh, maybe even first person uh, player video games that are interconnected between multiple players. Sometimes we bring role players in so that they can practice, the cadets can practice negotiation skills, building relationships, gaining intelligence with civilians on the battlefield, as we call them, through what we call key leader engagements. Uh, so there's a multiple of opportunities that you can do besides just running around the field with an M16 in your hand. Another method that we use, and it was first introduced by the Germans at the Kriegs Academy, and then really kind of pioneered by the Harvard Business School faculty, is the case method. So this provides a really profound educational innovation that puts the student in the shoes of a decision maker and gives them the same challenges that have confronted past military leaders with the same constraints that they've had and with the same you know, lack of information that may, incomplete information that may be found when they're in the actual environment. And it's this kind of this dynamic process of exchanging ideas, exchanging perspectives, uh, defending points, building on each other's ideas when you're working in a group 
that really gets to this level of critical creative thinking. So a couple of examples that we have used in the past that I'll share with you. Uh, the first one is uh, a book called The Defense of Duffer's Drift, which was written by a guy named Major, Major General Ernest uh, Swinton uh, during the Boer War. So General Swinton was a platoon leader uh, for the British Army during the Boer War, and he wrote about his experiences um, in a graphic kind of novel where he was leading 40 of his British soldiers defending this drift. Um, and during this, um, during this book, the platoon leader has several dreams. And during each of those dreams, he defends this drift from a, in a different manner. Uh, and he fails along each of the ways. But as a good soldier, he learns from each previous iteration and tries something new. And by the last dream, he's able to successfully defend that drift. And what we did is we, we used this book as a baseline and brought in a professor of strategy from the, National, from the, the Naval War College at Newport who led a discussion with the cadets as they walked through several of these dreams to learn how to iterate in order to understand past problems and how to utilize your soldiers in the best manner in order to uh, defend this particular piece of ground. Another more recent example that we use is uh, the attack at cop heating. So in this case, this is a, uh, a cop is a combat outpost. Um, so this was from 2009 that uh, a young infantry lieutenant with a small group of his soldiers were up in this uh, uh, really kind of small patrol base operation that was going on in Afghanistan and they got attacked and lost a lot of soldiers. So we're able to see more from a contemporary environment how a student can explore and evaluate these decisions made on the ground by junior leaders, junior leaders that are in a position that they may be in in a very short amount of time, so that they can understand kind of the contemporary problems that are associated with combat operations in Afghanistan uh, and the problems that they encountered when this particular platoon transitioned from vehicle patrol bases to a static patrol base at a combat outpost. Another way that we go about this is looking at ethical case studies. So it's very powerful when we're able to look at this. And in the senior class, we use either movies or books. In this case, uh, that's a picture from the movie Lone Survivor, which is both a movie and a book. Uh, that covers four members of SEAL Team 10, 10 who faced a moral dilemma during Operation Red Wings in 2005. So the SEAL team was out in the mountains of Afghanistan. They came upon three goat herders who had compromised their position, and they had this moral dilemma. Uh, it was a very important mission to get a very high-value high target, uh, and they could either kill these three goat herders and then compromise uh, and then continue on with their mission, or they could release them. And at that point, their mission would have been completely compromised, and they would have had to terminate unsuccessfully. And what we can do is we can look through, this allows the soldiers to look through a combination of, of uh, variables to include looking at rules of engagement, looking at Gene Geneva Conventions, uh, looking at the personalities and the moral decision making that goes on by the four members of this team uh, in order to ascertain really these moral perspectives and then evaluate the decisions that were made at the end of this. So it's a very powerful tool. So beyond these tools, though, the most important thing that we teach our students, at least in the Army ROTC program, is that of leadership. Um, and it's another subject, it's another philosophy that we use that we borrowed also from the Germans, and it's called Ostrag Taktik. So if you let me, I'll, I'll give a quick little uh, history lesson about where we kind of got this concept and how we apply it in today's military. So back in 1806 at the Battle of uh, Jena and Auerstadt, the, uh, the Prussians were outnumbering the, the French about two to one. But because the Prussians were badly managed uh, and the French, they came up against a military genius in Napoleon, the French pretty much wiped the floor with them. So the, the Germans, or the Prussians, uh, the Germans went and spent about the next century really redeveloping their force structure, redeveloping their doctrine and how they go about leading in order to provide more maneuver, more flexibility, freedom of maneuver up and down their chain of command opening up more for initiative at the junior leader side. And they came up with a term called Ostrag Tactique, which is loosely translated to mission type orders, which means you don't give your subordinates a direct order. You don't tell them exactly what to do. Uh, you tell them an objective and you let them go and figure out how they're going to achieve it on their own. Right? So in this case, it's okay to be different. It's okay not to follow orders, but it's as long as it's the manner in which you don't disobey the orders, that as long as it's within the framework of the mission and achieves the overall outcome, it's okay. Uh, and, and one example of this in action from the Germans that achieved amazing results was in May of 1940 at the Battle, battle of Eben Amal. And in this battle, the, the German mission was to capture by surprise the surface of Eben Amal in order to guarantee the transit of the army over the Meuse-Albert Canal, neutralize the artillery and anti uh, 
uh, uh, anti-aircraft weapons, and break the en enemy resistance. Now what happened is many of the gliders that took these soldiers there never made it to the target. They ended up landing short or breaking down, including the commanders. So what was left on the ground was a young, young lieutenant, a staff sergeant, and about 40, 40 paratroopers who ended up having to complete this mission by themselves. And they were able to do it successfully because they understood the mission. They understood the, what was supposed to be achieved at the end. They were cross-trained. They had built trust within their organization. And most importantly, they had this culture of Austrag tactique built within them, right? This culture that they should be enabled to accept initiative and empowered to go do these things on their own without having their higher headquarters to tell them that it was okay to go do that. And we've kind of borrowed this concept within the United States Army, and we've called it Mission Command. So it's kind of this philosophy of leadership that we're teaching to our subordinate leaders and our junior leaders in the Army right now. Right? This idea that you should not micromanage your organization, that you should find ways to empower them to take initiative and to accept certain risks, and allow them to make decisions as long as those decisions are going to achieve the outcome of the mission. So let me share some of these principles with you really quick and kind of my thoughts on them, because it kind of shapes how we approach those case studies and a few other things that we do. The first principle is called build cohesive teams through mutual trust. And when we talk about trust, we look at it from two perspectives. There is a confidence component and there's a competence component. From a confidence perspective that when I tell a subordinate to do something that we expect them to do it, pretty standard thing within the military. But also from a competence portion. So not only when I tell them to do it that they're actually gonna do it, but that they can do it to a standard that is acceptable to the higher headquarters. And the way they do that is through collective training over and over again and evaluation. So that if I have seen my organization do a task over and over again in a peacetime environment, when I ask them to do it in combat, I can trust that they are going to do it without me providing that direct oversight, without having to be micromanaged from me. The second thing is creating a shared understanding. So in the Army, we talk about before you go into an operating environment, you need to understand that environment in terms of the political situation, the economic situation, the social, uh, and the military environment. But it's not enough for an individual to gain an understanding. You've got to have created a shared understanding or a common understanding between your, your superiors, your peers, your subordinates, and everybody within the organization. That includes understanding why you're going there, understanding the problem itself, and then understanding the approaches that you have come up with to, to solving those problems. The next one is a clear commander's intent. And I know that's kind of military jargon, but what it simply means is to provide a clear understanding of why we are doing this operation in the first place. I think that we are the only military within the world that has a requirement for us to tell our soldiers why we are giving them a task. In many other militaries, you just have to tell them to do it and they have to do it. In ours, there's a requirement to tell them why. And I think that's very powerful when it gets down to what happens when something changes on the ground. So we need to provide them a why, an overarching purpose, provide them a focus so that they understand what their left and right limits are, and provide them an outcome or an end state so that when something changes on the ground, a condition changes on the ground, they all have the same aim point and they can make the adjustments without having to go to their higher headquarters and ask for approval. Okay, and then the final thing is, uh, or the fourth thing is using mission type orders. So as I've already kind of dissuaded the use of micromanage, it is still important within the military and all services to give orders. But it's the method in which you give those orders. What we don't want is to tell somebody how to do something. We want to tell them what is expected of them and why and let them figure out the how. And this is important that they understand within that culture that it is important for them to be able to make those decisions. What I find with a lot of junior leaders is that they're afraid to make the decision. They always want kind of reassurance from their higher headquarters before they go out and do something. And it's this culture of off-strag tactique or mission command that kind of empowers them to go do these things. But it really needs the conditions set by the leader. And those first four bullets kind of set those conditions. And if you do those first four right, it's the bottom two that's on the subordinate to do. And that's exercise discipline initiative and accept prudent risks, which really simply means make good decisions. When we talk about initiative, what we mean is acting in the absence of orders. So that when something changes on the ground and the orders are no longer valid, that person feels comfortable to go and make a decision. But it's got to be disciplined. And that's on the leader to set those left and right limits, make sure that the person executing that initiative understands why they're accomplishing something and what it is that they want achieved. And then the accepting of prudent risk, obviously, um, 
risk is, is the acceptance of um, deliberate exposure to potential loss, and that loss may be life, uh, it may be money, or it may be equipment. But when the leader determines that the risk is worth the cost in order to achieve that outcome. So one of the ways that we can go about training this is some of the case studies I said, but the ultimate case study that we use in order to look at something like this is what we call the battle staff ride. And for our class, our capstone event is the battle staff ride at Lexington and Concord. So a staff ride is more than just kind of a battlefield visit. It is a combination of preliminary study, which includes uh, a number of readings that our students need to do and some presentations in order to make them understand the strategic and operational context. It's followed by a field study portion where you actually go out to Lexington Green in this instance or the North Bridge or the Parker's Revenge site uh, and get to walk the land and kind of put what you've learned in the preliminary study phase into practice on the ground. And then finally followed by an integration phase where you're able to distill the lessons learned from the battle. Right? And we can do that either through a series of discussions. We can have the students write a paper and then defend that paper. Uh, and in our instance, I have our students do both. So staff rides can achieve multiple objectives, right? You can learn about tactics that are used on the battlefield at the time. Um, you can learn about the use of terrain. You can learn about the use of some type of enablers. So if, if somebody wanted to use artillery in support of an infantry unit, a staff ride is very useful for that. Uh, in the case of a battle that happened in 1775, sometimes the tactics don't really translate all that well to the contemporary environment. But what we do know is that warfare is a human endeavor, and we can learn a lot about leadership by going through these types of staff rides. And that's what we kind of focus here with Lexington. So specifically, we're going to look at the junior leaders and the decisions that they made as they approached Lexington Green. Right? So as an example, the lead element of the lead element of the British force that left Boston and walked up Mount Massachusetts Avenue, that platoon leader was a Marine called Lieutenant Adair. And what we'll do is we'll place our, our students in the shoes of Lieutenant Adair put them right at the apex of Lexington Green to let them see what that lieutenant may have been able to see. Obviously, the old meeting house isn't there anymore, but you get the picture. The road structure is still the same, and it's very powerful to be on the ground there. And going back to this kind of idea of mission command, we know that in order for a junior leader to feel empowered to make decisions, at least make good decisions, they need to build trust within their organization. They need to have a shared understanding with their higher headquarters of the environment. They needed to understand why they're conducting an operation, and they needed to understand what it is that they were doing. In the case of Lieutenant Adair, that lead, that lead platoon leader for the British element, we find that he was a Marine. He was pretty new to the organization. We find that he was working for an Army commander, and they had not worked together before. We find out that when he had gotten to the Green, he did not know his mission. The, like the uh, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith, who was the commander of the British forces, kind of kept it secret from his officers to make sure that the word did not get out um, so they could get all the way to Concord beforehand. As you recall, the mission was to Concord. It had nothing to do with Lexington. So if we look less at whether or not the British or the Americans fired the first shot um, or how they were set up and, and how they completed their tactics and look more at the decision that was made by that lieutenant as he approached that green and say, why did you even walk on that green in the first place? It really had nothing to do to the mission, do with the mission. Then we can start distilling lessons learned about how difficult it is to be a young, young junior officer uh, with minimal information that really gets placed in a bad situation as they're approaching some place like the Green. Uh, and from that perspective, this operation looks a lot like the things that are going on in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria now. Maybe not the weapon systems, but the decisions are very, very similar. Uh, and I think that's a very powerful tool for these young officers. So before I close out the program, what I'd like to do is uh, discuss one other opportunity that, uh, that's provided to our cadets. Uh, and that's what we call the Cultural Understanding and Language Program. And it was established in 2008 in order to provide students an opportunity to uh, travel around the world um, and train with foreign military forces, conduct some humanitarian assistance, uh, and learn a little bit about a foreign language. And we do this in order to kind of build these culturally astute leaders uh, help build relationships with our allies, and really support theater security cooperation objectives from our combatant commanders around the, the world. So we send about 1,000 students uh, each summer to 24 different countries uh, in order to do those things. Two years ago, I was lucky enough to lead a group of uh, 30 cadets to, uh, to Montenegro, the newest NATO member. Uh, we spent some time training with their uh, army, so some of the best rock climbers in the world, our cadets got to train with those. Uh, they got to fire some uh, Russian-made AK-47s, so see some, uh, some of our adversaries' weapon systems. 
Uh, and they also got to do some humanitarian assistance. So that picture off to the far right is uh, the U.S. Ambassador to Montenegro, who they did a river cleanup exercise with. And then last summer, I got to go to uh, take another 40 cadets to Honduras in Central America. Uh, and in Honduras is the home to a Joint Task Force Bravo, which is a multi-service headquarters that uh, conducts counter criminal, counter drug operations across Central America. Uh, so these students got to come down and see a real kind of operation in progress in Central America. They got to interact with the Honduran Military Academy. They spent a couple of weeks training with them. They also got to go to the U.S. Em uh, Embassy and meet the ambassador and hear what uh, kind of from a political perspective, what our goals and our, uh, our interests are in the Central American region. Uh, and then they got to do several other things, including looking at some, uh, some cultural activities in the area. So uh, I, I'm happy to answer more questions about this in the question and answer period. And quite frankly, uh, Cadet LaMarshall joined me, uh, also went to Vietnam last summer, so she can uh, answer some of those questions. Uh, so what I'd like to do before I you know, open this up to questions is invite uh, Renee up here. Um, introduce her a little bit. I know she was already introduced, but as you know, she's a senior at Tufts University. She's majoring in uh, history. She's also a, uh, this is her second ROTC program since she spent her freshman year at Tulane University, so she can talk about uh, multiple ROTC programs. She is the senior ranking cadet within our cadet battalion, so she's a bat cadet lieutenant colonel and battalion commander. She's been recognized as a distinguished military graduate, which places her in the top 20% in the nation. Uh, and of course, she's going to be entering the active duty in the military intelligence branch. So with that, uh, you know, I appreciate you uh, opening this floor, uh, inviting me here, and, and I'd like to open the floor up for any questions that uh, anybody might have. Okay. Oh, anyway, I can't. <laughs> you can hear me. Uh, how does this work? Put it in your mouth, please. How does this work with? <laughs> All right. Uh, Joint service operations, for example, uh, a lot of uh, air support, for example, uh, and um, that would seem you have to have the same culture, the same general training for the complex air support and a lot of other um, uh, you know, joint uh, weaponry that uh, is required now with the, between particularly Air Force and the Army. So uh, I'm going to go about the long way of answering this question, but I'll try and keep it short. <laughs> You know, after, after 1979, after the failed uh, hostage rescue of, in Iran and some of the other operations that early, happened in the early 80s, the military realized that the services tended to be very parochial. They didn't do a lot of training together. Um, and with more complex operations, there was really a requirement for them to work together. So in 1986, there was what was called the Goldwater-Nichols Act. And that required the services to work together. So it did a couple of things. One, it required the services to go to the other services schools. So I can't go to an Army school now without having at least one Air Service and one Sea Service member within that cohort of my class. And the same thing is true if I go to the, the Navy War College right now. They've got to have a land component and an air component member in there. So we've kind of inculcated that jointness within the professional military education system across the three services. But that doesn't start until you're about a major or a lieutenant commander, depending on what service you're in. Uh, the other thing it required, the Goldwater-Nichols Act, is it required any officer before they became a general officer to be what we call joint qualified. They needed to serve quarters for at least three years before they got committed or promoted to general officer. Uh, but now to get back to answering your question, so there's no requirement to do anything joint at the ROTC level or even as a lieutenant or a captain. Um, but we are very blessed at the MIT program in that we have all three services there. Not all ROTC programs across the country have all three services. I said there's 270 Army programs. There's only about 60 or 7 Navy programs across the country. Uh, so there's nothing in the curriculum that forces jointness within it. Um, but we do a few things that make us kind of work together. Um, but I would, just, I would just go back to the idea that you need to kind of think through problems and be agile and adaptive, that when you get to that point, when you're a officer, particularly at the higher levels and have to work with the other services, that you're able to adapt the way you think and adapt your relationships. Just like we send them overseas to do this CULP mission so that we can better interact with some of uh, the other cultures across the world. Um, many of you folks know that the Army culture is much different than the Air Force culture, which is much different than the Navy culture. And just the idea of being able to adapt the way you think and adapt the way you speak and adapt the way you plan and execute, um, I think that kind of compensates for the fact that we don't really have a joint ROTC program. I hope that answered your question. I don't know if you want to add anything. I think, sir, that I, I think it 
the cadets and midshipmen at each school also just by nature of all being in ROTC in the different services, we, we have share bond. And so I, what I've seen at least at Tufts, that all the cadets and midshipmen are close despite different programs and I've seen that at other schools as well. So even though our training doesn't overlap, I think our academic experience is very similar. Um, so I think we, we do share that sort of bond. Gresh in the corner. Uh, Renee, you, uh, this is the first time I've heard you were at, Viet at Vietnam. Yes. Okay. Many of us are Vietnam veterans. So tell us. Uh, we just had an aircraft carrier uh, go into uh, Hanoi. And what was your experience with, with talking with the military there? Uh, so I. Is it this? Your the microphone isn't very strong. No, it doesn't seem to work. I can try this. See you. This one is any better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was in Vietnam for a month over the summer. Um, I was in Hanoi actually the entire time, um, except for three days we were at um, Ha Long Bay. Uh, it was w absolutely wonderful. It was an amazing experience. Uh, my job, we didn't really do any uh, humanitarian um, or like mil uh, tactical field training, but we worked at their, sort of their version of West Point, their military academy, and we taught uh, cadets and officers English. So we had a series of, we had a sort of a, a pretty uh, comprehensive English curriculum, and we had a series of lessons that we taught, and uh, throughout the three weeks that we were there, um, officers and cadets would kind of filter through and, and attend each of the lessons, and it was absolutely such a remarkable experience. We formed really close bonds with uh, the cadets there. Um, I know some of the cadets in my program are still in touch with, with their cadets, um, and we were able to see, to really experience life in the city of Hanoi, which was great. We saw a lot of the history um, from the Vietnam War. We saw a lot of their museums and monuments and things. And actually, the, I think the best part for me was getting to interact with the Vietnamese civilians um, who were all absolutely more than happy to welcome us into their country and just so excited to show us and kind of in, embrace us as, as visitors. So I think that was, for me, was the best part, was the, they're unbelievably friendly and, and welcoming. And I, I felt really honored to sort of be uh, welcomed back in that way. Hang on. Were you, were you able to have an opportunity to talk to any of the uh, Vietnam veterans, that is the Vietnamese veterans of the war? Actually, yes, a bit. Um, so we, we mainly worked with cadets who were a lot younger, um, so not as many uh, older uh, actual Vietnam War veterans, but we did meet some civilians um, who had lived through the war. Some of them uh, had had been soldiers, some of them had just been civilians. Um, they, they didn't talk very much about it, I have to say. It wasn't something that, okay. that we were sort of instructed not to discuss it in depth with them. Um, <laughs> just because the sort of the purpose of the mission was supposed to be very positive. Um, but we actually did talk to some civilians about it and and they they sort of talked about the hardships but not in a not in a in a overwhelmingly negative way. The reason I asked that question was I was thinking it was an opportunity in a way to understand the mindset of somebody who is fighting for their country in their country. And that's sort of a unique perspective, which uh, no living American has experienced at this point. Yeah, no, we definitely did get that perspective. We, uh, we spent a lot of time at um, museums and various monuments and sort of, uh, I don't know, memorial type uh, places. And so we did get a, a good exposure to, um, to their mindset and to uh, sort of what their country means to them, what their independence means to them. So we did definitely get some good exposure with that. And we also actually went to, um, we went to uh, Dien Bien Phu, which is the site of, uh, an earlier site uh, when they f fought against the French for their independence. So we, we got some really good exposure in that as well as to how they sort of value their independence. Thank you. Questions for Colonel Godfrey? Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a lot of questions, but I don't know which one to start with, and I know I'm only going to get one or two. Uh, but something slightly off the subject, but on the minds of the public here in the 
at in current times. Uh, what is the number of uh, females to males in the ROTC, in particular the local ones? And also, do you uh, go through the uh, uh, harassment uh, <laughs> uh, training also? Great. Let's let's start with the easy one. I think <laughs> across ROTC is it something like 20, 30 percent? Yeah. And in our program, we're somewhere around over 40 percent, almost 50. So uh, we do have a couple of schools that tend to be very women heavy. So obviously Wellesley College, anybody we get from there is going to be female. Uh, Endicott College is something like 70 percent female as well. Uh, and then for some reason, um, the population that comes out of the top tier schools tends to be overwhelmingly female for some reason. Um, so the smart women all come into the army, I guess. <laughs> Uh, so we have pretty good numbers. Um, yes, the Army has been going through sexual harassment training. We have a what we call the SHARP program, Sexual Harassment Assault Response and Prevention. Um, it's changed names throughout time, and we go through training. It seems like at a minimum every six months, but reality is once a month. We're doing some level of training. Um, and I think, you know, I think the Army gets a bad name for... Um, what comes out in the news about kind of sexual harassment claims, sexual assault claims. And, and I think that's primarily because we've been very transparent about it. Um, what I've seen now being on a university campus is that they are decades behind where the Army are in terms of responding to these types of incidents. So at MIT, we have just established within the last three years for the first time some type of sexual misconduct committee. Um, and for the first time, we've put policies in place at MIT uh, that prevent um, fraternization, let's just call it, between undergraduate population and the professors. It was just kind of rule of thumb that you don't kind of hit on your students. But there's never anything in writing and some of the policies and procedures uh, to deal w with when there is a complaint, whether it's at the student level or the faculty level, they just weren't in place. And those are things that we have had in place for a very long time within the military. Um, and so we have, uh, you know, very long-standing procedures on how to deal with that. Say the one place where the Army could possibly get better, and I'll speak just on the Army for this perspective, um, is you know the investigation happens in-house and then commanders get to make the decision. And what I've noticed, at least on the Title IX side within a university like MIT, is they have folks doing this stuff that are full-time trained professionals. Um, and if there's a sexual harassment complaint, let's say at Boston University, they may ask me to go do it. Um, and other than my 20 years of experience in the military and going through my training every month. Um, I just got to kind of refer to a regulation, but, but I'm not a professional and, and, and that's not my profession to go do that stuff. Um, but I hope I answered your question. Yeah, it looks like there are battles ahead. There are battles ahead. <laughs> there certainly are. Um, I think we've fought them quite a bit though, so far for the last couple. I don't know. You may have a different perspective coming in and what you've seen no, so I, far. I agree. I think we do, a, we do a very thorough job, at least in our battalion, of educating our cadets and kind of fostering a culture that's very different, I think, from what people imagine. I'm rather the, curious as to how... She, she wants to get you on the microphone. I don't think I need it, but <laughs> yeah, I do. I'm being being sorry. Recorded. We do. Yeah. How are the students selected to go into these fascinating programs, which were certainly not around during our time at Norwich or... Uh, Boston University of BC, how are they selected? So for, for pretty much any program, and we have a number of other things, internships that are just focused on RTC, um, they all have some level of order of merit list. Um, and each one of them are weighed very heavily through grade point average and physical fitness. Um, for the cult program very specifically, number one, you have to be a contracted cadet. So there are students that come and just join the program um, but they haven't contract. They just go through the classes. They're still, decide, they're still deciding whether or not they want to sign the contract. They're not eligible for those types of things. So it's only people that have signed a contract, generally have good grades, um, generally have good physical fitness scores, and then get bonus points if they speak a foreign language or have other foreign travels. Um, and then that goes into a national order of merit list, and they take really the top 1,000 people, with a couple of exceptions. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the National Guard, state National Guards have state partnerships with uh, foreign countries. 
Um, somebody may be below that cut line on the Aurora Merit List, but if they happen to be, let's say, in the Maine National Guard, and that state partnership was Montenegro, they'll select somebody from that state because of that relationship. Um, but to, the easy answer to the question is, is grades and physical fitness scores. Thank you. There are other programs like internships where they might look at a little deeper. They might look at academic major or other programs that they've done in the past, right? So there's internships at Lincoln Labs, for instance. Uh, and they'll take into consideration the fact that somebody is a computer science engineer at MIT over a liberal arts major at Tufts and probably let them into that assignment. Okay, hang on. I happen to be a graduate of the Naval Academy, and I noticed that recently they're building a brand new big cyber warfare center. And so the, so the midshipmen there are going to be able to major in that and, and treat that as a career objective. And I wondered, uh, is that just service specific? Or do technology improvements across the board enter into what you are able to teach and, and use in your Practice. Great. Um, so an excellent question. And I believe that the Army had the first cyber unit. And right now, the, um, they, it looks like they are going to I mentioned combatant commands. And if you're familiar with, with the military, um, there are six geographic combatant commands and three functional ones. There's a, you know, ones that cover the continents. And then the functional ones are strategic command, transportation command, uh, and then special operations command. I think what you're going to see very shortly is a fourth functional command called U.S. Cyber Command. And right now, Cyber Command, what is building up into that falls under Strategic Command. Um, and, and what we see for Cyber Command originally fold, f fell under or was built under the Cyber National Mission Force, which was part of the Army perspective. And I think right now, each service is figuring out at different speeds and different tempos how big of an organization they're going to have in order to do this. Um, so uh, I, I, I think your question is, all three services are doing this. Uh, they're all starting right now. The Army, three years ago, for the first time, commissioned cyber officers. So we went from 16 specialties to 17 specialties. And we commissioned our first cyber officers, nine the first year. One of them was out of my program at MIT. So they were smart to get somebody there. Uh, and in the past now, I think they, they commissioned 70 or 80 in this last class. Uh, and all three services are going at a different speed and tempo. But I think you're going to see it consolidated under one functional uh, combatant command on top of what the National Security Agency is doing with their defense. Okay, next one is over here. Uh, Renee, I have another question about you and ROTC. You experienced Tulane and now Tufts. Could you explain how you learned about ROTC because you're from Massachusetts and applied up here, then went to a southern school and then came back? Could you just give us some yeah, details? So, so I actually did not go into college thinking I was going to be an ROTC. I have no military background in my family. Um, I, d I don't even think I knew that the program existed, honestly, until I got to school. Um, but so I went to uh, Tulane, as Gresh said, um, and I was didn't really know what I wanted to do for a major. didn't really know what I wanted to study. A little closer. Okay. There you go. Um, is, is this good? Okay. Better. Really better. Better. Very close. Okay. Um, so I, I didn't know what I was going to study, and I was looking at the uh, Tulane course uh, catalog when I got there, and I saw that they had a military history class. Um, and I, I thought, I, I really like history. As uh, it said in my bio, I'm now a history major. Um, and I figured military history could be interesting, so I uh, enrolled in the class actually as a civilian. Um, at Tulane, you can... Uh, get course credit for, for these ROTC classes as part of, even if you're a civilian. So I enrolled in the class, and it was me and seven other cadets and our uh, uh, PMS at Tulane, and I absolutely fell in love with the class. I loved the professor. I loved my classmates. I thought it was so interesting. Um, and so just throughout the semester, I asked them questions. I got to know about the program. Um, I was very hesitant to join, actually. I figured there was absolutely no way I could do it, and I, I just I thought it was so out of my league. Um, but I, I found that I, I ended up really liking it, and I, I loved the curriculum, I loved the material. So at this point, I had decided to transfer. I had decided to come up to Tufts. I didn't know if Tufts had ROTC. I hadn't looked into it. Um, I arrived at Tufts and then quickly met 
uh, one of my, my fellow senior cadet at Tufts, Tulua Akinyemi, uh, she's going to be a med service officer. Um, I met her very early on in my time at Tufts, and she said, yeah, I'm a cadet, you should come check it out. And then I think the first time I ever went to, uh, to meet with our recruiter, uh, Mr. McDonough, I was sitting in his office at MIT, and four girls walked by from Wellesley. It was Cadet Park and Cadet Han and two other girls. And they kind of leaned into the office, and they said, you absolutely have to join. You can do it. Anyone can do it. Don't feel overwhelmed or don't feel like it's out of your league. You can, you can do this. And I was just so excited to meet these four unbelievable women who said, join. And then, of course, the fifth being Tulua. Um, that I, on the spot, said, this is what I'm going to do. This is my thing. So that was kind of how I found it, um, with no intentions whatsoever of finding it. But it found me, I guess. Uh, and this is a question for uh, either Colonel Godfrey or Renee. Probably, probably both of you. What What do you find is the atmosphere? I, I went through college in the in the sixties, seventies. Uh, the The attitude towards ROTC was, uh, you know, we're in the middle of Vietnam War. Things were were turning negative. It was hard to be in, uh, in ROTC on lots of campuses. What do you What do you see? Is how is the uh, What's the atmosphere like today? How do you How do you see that? So, so it depends on the school, I suppose. Um, I had a perception. Of course, I was before this assignment. I was out in the Midwest, you know, the heartland. Um, great support from the community, um, and it was it was very very kind of vocal um, in that support. And I think I had this perception, even being from New England. I'm originally from Rhode Island. I had this perception of Cambridge as uh, not being all that supportive of the military. Um, obviously, Harvard, Tufts, and many other schools in this region kicked ROTC off campus in the early '70s. Um, so I was very reticent to, to think about the kind of support I was going to get when I got to these schools. Um, I stepped foot on MIT, and MIT was a different story. Um, former President Gray, who just passed away, was an ardent supporter of the program, um, and it reflected across the entire culture of the organization. Um, you know, that may help that they have several billions of dollars worth of funding from the National uh, <laughs> Defense Department. Um, but they've certainly reverberated across everybody from the faculty down to the janitors all the way up to the president. Um, what I was very surprised at was the amount of support that we got at Harvard. Um, president Faust, who's leaving this year, is a uh, Civil War historian. Her father has a long history in the military. Um, and when she got back on campus, um, she reinstituted the ROTC programs and officially recognized them. Up until 2012, when they re-signed the Navy back into Harvard, uh, they officially couldn't even transfer funds between Harvard and MIT if it had to do with ROTC. Um, and now the president of the university allows, you know, comes to the commissioning ceremonies. They do it right on the steps of Memorial Church at Harvard. Um, each year they do all sorts of, uh, you know, supportive events. Um, and, uh, you know, what I've seen at Tufts is very, very similar. But um, I was amazed at the amount of support. There's still some faculty. Uh, every now and then that you might hear something about giving a hard time to a student um, or, you know, primarily as a group, not authorizing academic credit for the ROTC program, which is by law they're supposed to do, but they get ways around it, probably because they're top-tier universities. Um, but other than that, significant amount of support that I just wasn't expecting. Maybe you can talk about Tufts. Yeah, similar, I mean, similar to what he said, Tufts, I think the student body is curious about it. Uh, they, most students actually don't know that ROTC exists. Um, most students don't know anything about us, so I think more than anything they're curious. Um, people tend to be friendly and polite when we walk around in uniform and ask us questions. Um, there's definitely a lot of misunderstanding about what ROTC is and what we're actually doing as cadets, so it's we prefer when people ask us questions and they're vocal rather than just sort of like looking at us from afar. Um, but we do at Tufts have the benefit of the Fletcher School, which has a lot of good uh, relationships with the military, um, and there are veterans there, and there's a military fellow actually at Fletcher, so we have that sort of connection to, to help us, I don't know, have a, a, a little bit more of a uh, military presence there, I guess. Um, but I would say if, if th there's no hostility, um, just sort of a curiosity and maybe a, sometimes a poor understanding of what we're doing. But. Okay, Jim, hang on. 
Uh, I guess to the previous question a little bit, what would you say is the percentage of ROTC students relative to the total student population in your schools? L less than 1%. So if we, if, if we look at the, an incoming, let's say just Harvard, uh, Harvard incoming freshman class has somewhere around 2,000 students. Um, and historic average is maybe we see two uh, come in. The last couple of years we've seen four or five, but uh, even that's, you know, it's very low. What about MIT? Uh, MIT is very similar. When I got into the MIT program, we had two MIT students in the entire program. Now we're up to 20. Uh, most of our students came from um, the Salem State University or Endicott College or Gordon. Um, so we've seen a significant change in that. Uh, I think the incoming MIT class is somewhere around 2,000 as well, and we've been getting about 10 per year. Do you have any idea what it was back in the, this is, this, I mean, back in my time, back in the 60s? I mean, just as a... Uh, Since MIT was a land-grant college and military instruction was required, Every freshman and sophomore up until about, I think, 1953 was required to take ROTC classes at MIT. Is someone going mm -hmm. to confirm that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. The Air Force, Navy, and uh, Army ROTC at Harvard, they each had about 200, 250 in each out of a total class of 11,000. That was during the Korean War. And then as soon as that ended, it all, each one dropped down to about 50 in each. That's right. So, so what I saw in the numbers, looking back at least in the late 60s, it was about 50 or 60 per service, depending on the surface. Uh, and then after it got banned in 71, 72, um, it just went down to zero. And it was just a few years later that you know, individual students started convincing people in administration mm. to head over to MIT and taking classes there. But that had to be done under the table because of the, the ban on ROTC at Harvard. But all of the schools are at about the same percentage, very, very low percentage, which quite frankly is about the same across the United States. Uh, very small percentage of folks that serve, very, very small percentage of folks that even know anybody that serve in the military these days. You mean enlisted or officer? Enlisted or officer. In general. That's right. Colonel? Okay. Colonel over here. You just did a segue for me. Unfortunately for this shooting that happened down in Florida, I saw three ROTC students. How is the high school programs involved in this? So junior ROTC program was also established in the National Defense Act of 1916. Um, we do not have a formal relationship between, let's say, my program and the junior ROTC programs that are within the Boston area. We have an informal relationship. So I provide some guidance and mentorship to the program at Revere High School, East Boston High School, and Methuen High School. Um, and all three services have junior ROTC programs, um, and there's, I don't know, 5,000 programs across the United States. Uh, the junior ROTC programs are not like feeder schools would be to a college. Uh, we look at it more as a building good citizens. So we teach them about citizenship, we talk to them about, talk to them about service, um, and probably, I don't have a good percentage, but a very small percentage, a very small number, come out of the junior ROTC program and come directly into college. Um, many of them will go on to serve in, in the enlisted uh, ranks, uh, but at least at my school, I don't see a lot of junior, former junior ROTC program students coming into to our program. And the ones I deal with at those three schools I mentioned, um, I maybe interview one or two out of those programs a year for an ROTC scholarship. So I don't see a large number coming out of there. Okay, we have time for a couple more. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. This is, uh, there are two questions, somewhat related, but the first is uh, how many, uh, or do you place people or graduates into the missile defense? Uh, uh, you know, the Army is responsible for defense of the nation, missile defense systems. And the second question is, occurred to me when uh, you're, um, Senior was talking about Vietnam, and uh, remind me of this uh, burn series on PBS. You know, it's been through my life, I've seen a lot of war. Not myself, but I mean, I lived through it and I had family. You hate the enemy. They're bloodthirsty, they're terrible. But you know, after it's all over, gosh, they're pretty nice, they're your neighbors. And she went to Vietnam and everything was fine. 
But if you go through the uh, Vietnam you know, PBS series, you get it from their perspective, you get it from our perspective, the enlisted people, and the lousy command structure mm. that went on. Uh, do you show that to your students? So the command structure, um, you know, uh, the, the current National Security Advisor wrote a book called Dereliction of Duty, um, H.R. McMaster, and it was about um, kind of the decisions that were made during Vietnam. Um, it's not something that I show to these students, it's something I show to the majors when I teach at the Command and General Staff College. Um, we only have so many times, and 10 to, 10 to 12 hours a week is already enough time out of our schedule. Um, that I just got to be, uh, I've got to weigh and balance what it is I teach them and what I don't teach them. So some higher level kind of command and control structures are uh, probably on the, the lesser end of what I want them to get as a future lieutenant. Um, but remind me of the other question real quick. Uh, missile defense. Air, air and missile defense. So one of the 17 branches that we commissioned officers in is to what we call air defense artillery. Um, in fact, my, my uncle was a command sergeant major in the ADA branch at a Fort Bliss. Are you a former Army guy or? Yeah, and I was in Air Force, but it's like white science proving ground. Excellent. Uh, when they go into the air, uh, air defense artillery branch, uh, they will usually go into something a little more tactical before they go into uh, the strategic level air defense system. Uh, so air and missile defense, when I think of that, I'm thinking more of kind of the uh, a larger range air and missile defense systems rather than the tactical systems that might go around on trucks and just support some of the small tactical units. Um, but we will put them in the air defense artillery, and it's from there their branch will determine what specific positions they do, whether it's at the tactical or strategic level. Yeah, because there's a lot of research at Huntsville and so on. Do they go down there? You know? um, they may, depending on what they, they're assigned to do once they get assigned to the air defense artillery branch. So I don't, get, I don't put them into that specifically. I'll put them into the branch, and then their proponent will determine... Uh, whether or not they go down to Huntsville or whether they go somewhere else. I'm sure that Colonel Godfrey will stick around for a couple of minutes if you have more questions. <coughs> but in the meantime, let's wrap it up and give a big round of applause to the <laughs>